May our Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty, the creator of the heavens and earth, may he be with us all. May he be with you. May he bless you greatly. And God, today, may he hear your prayers. May God hear your petitions, desires. May he answer all of your pleas. And that God be by your side also to comfort you. He is our comfort. And so we thank the Lord for once again, we are here. And how time flies. It flies. Time does fly. But for God, time is the same. Time does not exist for God. It only exists for us. But we do say the time is passing by, but we know we need to know how to take advantage of time, take advantage of the days that are flying by and always, of course, going by the hand of God, walking in the path of our Lord. For in the world, well, there's a group of people that are rebellious, stubborn, arrogant, unbelieving, that do not love God. That group that follows the devil, they love the devil, they honor the devil, and they carry out the works of the devil, which is sin. But it is better for us to follow this path of loving our God, for with God we have eternal life. There are people who do not know that after physical life or physical death, there is eternity that exists. If people died the day that they physically die, well, then their spirit, their soul dies and fine. But as it turns out, that's not the case. There is life after death. And people ignore that. People don't believe it. They say it's a lie. We believe, for in the Bible, it has confirmed. And aside of, from that, it is the word of God. And before we sing the hymn to our God, we will be discussing, well, after we sing the hymn, we'll discuss it. We'll discuss what the word of God is, why God has convinced us he exists. For we have lived experiences with him, and this is why we know he exists, and this is why we are preaching to you that he does exist. And as the brother Alvaro said, our Lord had given the order to go throughout all the world and preach this gospel to whoever believes, whoever believes and is baptized. But also after that, it said, and who does believe, I will give signs to upon the sick. They will lay on hands to heal. They will speak new tongues. They will work miracles. These are the signs to those who believe and then are baptized will be saved. And so it's not just believing, but doing, doing many things that God wants us to do so that we can attain eternal life. And today we're also going to be discussing the Lord so that we can try and convince you, those who don't believe, those who are unbelieving, to show you God does exist. And we're going to sing a hymn to the Lord. The hymn that we sing here without any instrumentation. Hymn 228. To Jesus come, my friend. It is a calling to the gospel. A calling to convert to God. This hymn is a calling that we make to all the people who still have not made the decision of seeking God, seeking the path of perfection and continuing forward to eternity after life, there is eternal life with God. So this hymn is an invitation to you all to Jesus come, my friend, 228, we will be singing to honor our God. Ven amigo a Jesús. Pues Él murió por ti, recibirás la luz que quiere darte a ti. Mi buen Jesús murió para darte perdón, abre tu corazón. Dulce paz tendrás, día fatal vendrá, cuando no habrá lugar, la puerta se abre hoy y tú podrás entrar. 
entrar, más gracia ya no habrá, pues despreciaste hoy, acepta pecador, la salvación de Dios. Las manos del Señor se abren hoy para ti. Ven y confía en Él y serás muy feliz. Tus cuitas ponen Dios, pues se las llevará, quitará tu pesar por su consolación. Día fatal vendrá cuando no habrá lugar, la puerta se abre hoy y tú podrás entrar, más gracia ya no habrá, pues desprecia. Acepta pecador, la salvación de Dios. Glory to the Lord, glory to our God. All praises be to our King. You may be seated. You can get comfortable in your places. And just as I said to you in the beginning, the Lord, he sent or he gave authorization to his disciples to go throughout all the world to preach that this word ought to be preached in all the world. They preached there in those places in Europe and Asia and Africa. In that time, they could not travel to the Americas to evangelize, but the Lord had also had already set his eyes on America. And he set his eyes so much on America that after so many years having passed, where the devil has been trying to hinder the work and the growth of the church of God, where the devil celebrated and feasted in those countries in Europe and Asia and Africa, the devil meddled in so much in the life of Christians that he caused them to regress, turn back, and become idolaters. After having been Christians, first they were idolaters, then they convert to Christianity and to the Lord, and then they continued living idolatry. The Lord had mercy, and looking at America over 50 years ago, the Lord had mercy of a family seeking him with all their heart and made beautiful promises. The Lord spoke to this family of four and said, continue to congregate. I will make of you. That is a small flock. I will do great work, a great church in Colombia and all abroad, all over the world. And I will be in charge of bringing all the souls of converting people and gathering together, gathering them together in the place where I will manifest. I will be the one in charge of bringing them. And so this has come to pass. This has all been fulfilled. Now I say 50 years, but it's a little bit more than that. But God has converted people. He has convinced them with his word. With his word because the Lord began to speak to us. He began to give us the spiritual gifts, the gift of prophecy. He began to raise up prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, many people with the gift of prophecy. And so this has been the growth 
this has all allowed this growth to take place in the church because of the spiritual gifts and God's manifestation. And so the word of God then penetrates the heart. It penetrates the soul. The title of our sermon today is the word of the Lord is like a two edge sword. For those who know this topic, well, what is the two edged sword? It penetrates. It divides the soul, the heart, the deepest parts of your being. And so the Lord has convinced us. And from that time, he has been raising his congregation in such a way that there's about 1,200, 1,300 temples all around the world in over 60 countries, about 60 countries, the church, the congregation is there. God is speaking. God is managing his church with the spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is guiding his people, guiding us all and enamoring us all. And so without the word of God, without that two-edged sword, well, no congregation could be done. No one could convert any other human being. No one would convert. People could not be converted. The Bible, this, what we call the Bible, is the word of God. Why? Well, here, he spoke through his prophets. He spoke to Adam. He spoke to Eve. He spoke to Noah. He spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to all the kings, David, Samuel. He spoke to all of those people, Daniel. He made promises and everything was left written. All of the experiences and all of the things that God spoke of was left written. And so we give God thanks for his manifestation and for making himself known in this manner. And today, the Lord might say to us as well to evangelize and we must speak to the world. And what ease we do have to speak to the world through the internet. We thank the Lord for that as well, for all of this was all planned by him. He said he was going to be increasing knowledge and technology and knowledge to man. And well, this has happened. And we thank the Lord. And this is why today our sermon, the word of God, it is like a two-edged sword. And we're going to be reading some verses from the Bible And the way in which God speaks to the hearts of human beings and how a person converts to God. Now, in this moment, we have some rain, uh, some storms outside, and we're waiting for God to help us so that the Internet does not go out. And so we're hoping and waiting in our Lord. Very well. We're going to open our Bible in Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, verse 17. Ephesians six seventeen, which says, now this is advice the Apostle Paul gives to the church in Ephesus. And now in 17, he is telling them to take on the armor of God, that all men, women, believers in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who call themselves Christians, they have to have armor. They must be clothed with the whole armor of God, and it is in order to stand, to be strong and courageous against all of the wiles of the devil, because the devil constantly, every day, is attacking, is pursuing, persecuting the believers from in different ways, in different manners, with sickness, accidents, death, sadness, loneliness, blasphemy, Slander with all of these things, the devil is setting traps daily. He is attacking. We say attacking in other languages. Maybe you won't be able to know or won't know how to interpret this word, but attacking does not necessarily mean with dynamite or bombs. No, attacking means challenging someone with harm. Now, the devil comes and places sickness and accident. So I say, Well, the devil is attacking me. The devil is facing off against me. He's pursuing me, persecuting me. That's it. And so for those who are translating, I hope that you are able to translate that in the different languages so that no one twists or misinterprets the teaching, but rather that we give it the correct meaning to all of these words. And so we do say the devil daily, continuously is against us, harming us. And the Lord says, 
through the Apostle Paul, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Take the, or shod your feet and make sure that you gird your waist with that armor. Now here in 17, take the helmet of salvation. Now the helmet we know is something you put upon your head that soldiers more normally wear helmets. In, in the time of antiquity and medieval times, they would wear helmets during war. And it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword. Now, in that time, soldiers, they had armor. Those who were courageous, they had a sword to go into battle against their enemies. Yes, they would go in battle against their enemies. So it says, we too, we ought to be the same in putting on this whole armor and with that sword, with that sword, that word of God. And so with that sword, we are able to fight against the enemy. Again, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is God's doctrine. It is God's commands, the orders from the Lord, the promise of the Lord, the prophetic word of God. This is the two-edged sword, the word of God, which comes forth from the mouth of God, now be it here in the Bible written or through the gift of prophecy, through visions or dreams, revelations, God speaks, gives orders, makes promises. This is the word of God. And the word of God is compared to a two-edged sword. When God speaks that is how it is. That is how it will be. It is fulfilled. Everything is done. Everything becomes a reality. And God allows a rebellious heart, a person that is unbelieving, does not believe in God. When they hear the word of God, they convert. They convert because the word of God is like a two-edged sword that has penetrated the heart, the being. And so that person begins to cry. They weep and say, God is here. God is speaking to me. And they weep because who allows them that feeling? God. And so this is the word of God, which is like a two-edged sword. And it's not just this written word, but also the word that is spoken from God. Because God speaks today through the Holy Spirit, the gift of prophecy, the, pro the prophets. God uses their mouths to speak. The evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, they, taken up by the Spirit of God, God speaks through them. This is the Word of God, the living Word of God. This is what God, or what we call God speaking today. God manifests himself, and so his believers, they begin to lay on hands, and God begins to perform miracles and signs. And this is why we say God speaks today. This is God's Word. It is the two-edged sword. It penetrates the heart and soul. It does or God does his work. Now, 1 Corinthians. Now we go a little bit behind Ephesians, 1 Corinthians. It's about two books back from Ephesians. We have then Galatians and then Corinthians. We have Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24 and 25. The Apostle Paul here throughout the chapter we have him here speaking about the gift of prophecy and speaking in angelical tongues, heavenly tongues. The apostle gives an explanation to the believers on how they ought to put their spiritual gifts to work within the congregation, within the church, so that there are no misunderstandings. Now here in verse 24, the apostle is emphasizing concerning the word of God. Now, he is teaching about the gift of prophecy. He is teaching that he would come to a place to speak, and he would be speaking with understanding for others to hear. Now, also, there were those who prophesied. Those who prophesy, it says that it's not they who are speaking, but it is the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouths of men and women who have that gift of prophecy. And this is why he says to them in verse 24, 23 says, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, meaning they come together and congregate and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, 
Will they not say that you are out of your mind? So it is better that if you gather together as a church and you congregate in this place and it says, but if all prophesy, verse 24, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. Yes, because if this man or this woman comes in and someone gives them prophecy, prophesies to them and says, and why do you want to take your life? Because you have been on the brink of taking your life. Do not do that. Life belongs to me. I will transform you. I will change you. I will give you happiness. I will take away all of these thoughts from you. And so this person says, yes, God is here because who could have known this? No one knows me. No one knows what I've done or the intentions that I've had to do. And so God is here. And so it says, thus the secrets of their heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. And so in this moment, the word of God has acted as a two-edged sword that has penetrated the heart and soul of these people and has told them the secrets of their heart. That which was hidden was a secret. It was made manifested. It was revealed. And so people, if God has a calling for them for salvation, they convert to God. These people cry. They cry because they are touched in seeing how God has truly, he, he touches people's hearts. He makes them cry, weep. This is the word of God, like a two-edged sword. The word when God speaks, when someone as well who does not believe like a person who did not believe was with their family. And so the sister who go, goes to church, she had a family member who was close by and he, this person saw that she had the teachings on and he was angry. Why did you play that teaching you and your church, you and such and such person? I'm tired of this. I don't believe in that. And it says that this person had an experience. God gave this person an experience and spoke to him in dreams and said, I will teach you what this church is about. I will teach you what your parent is doing and what those teachings are. I will teach you everything that you are criticizing and casting down and despising. I will teach this to you. And with this dream, that was enough for this person to be touched. He woke up and was truly touched by that because God's word is like a two-edged sword. It penetrated his being. It penetrated his mind. And after, when he wakes up, He's completely changed, believing, and there, then he asked to actually listen to the sermons. This is what the word of God does. The word of God is a two-edged sword. And some people, some other denominations, they say that that verse here, it just means the written Bible. But the written Bible, it has the value, the spiritual value, and it acts in this way, when we believe in the Holy Spirit and the marvelous spiritual gifts, and aside from that, we live them. We live those experiences in our congregation. But if there is a group of people who do not believe that the Holy Spirit speaks, that the gift of prophecy does not exist, they don't think that God manifests himself, that was a lie only for the time of antiquity, and so they treat the Bible as a literal book. They treat it as another piece of literature and read it as such. And so they read it as a piece of literature and they also interpret it literally. And in this manner, the word of God does not act like a two-edged sword, that written word. In our case, and we do live those spiritual experiences with our Lord, it does, because when I begin to read it, I do it in the spiritual sense and not literally. And so the Holy Spirit comes to my life and allows me to understand what I am reading. And so 
He makes these scriptures living, brings them to life. And so, yes, this word then does become like a two-edged sword that enters your heart and does make those changes. And we learn the doctrine and we learn how it is I need to live my life to please God. And so this word of God, like a two-edged sword, it is only with the living manifestation of God with the reality of it. It is not just a theory. God needs to manifest himself in your life. We're going to read now in Revelation 1.16. Revelation 1.16. Now, here in the revelation of Apostle of the Apostle John, when he was exiled on an island in the island of Patmos in Greece, he was imprisoned, and God gave him visions, revelations, and this is the book. The revelations. Now God showed him many things of the things that were to occur in the future in the life of the believers and also in the life of the world, the life of human beings. Now, Revelation 1, 16. Now, John, he saw this vision of the Son of Man. He saw our Lord Jesus Christ in this vision. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 11, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so then he ordered him this, and he began to give him visions. He saw the Lord in 14, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet, it says here, they were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. That was the very grandiose, great way in which the Lord saw, or which John saw the Lord. Now it says, he, he had at his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. It says here again, from his mouth, the mouth of the Lord, the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Savior, who had been sent by God, all of the names that the Lord had. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, we've already said this sharp two-edged sword is the word of God. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So this word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, it, it was a sharp two-edged sword. When his word comes out, it does not return to him void, but it does God's will. Now, if we or if God opens his mouth to speak to a person and gives them blessings, offers them blessings, makes a promise of blessings and triumph and victory. Let us assume this person is living difficulties they're being threatened to be killed and to be kidnapped and take their life and this person prays to god please and asks the lord to protect him and the lord answers and says do not worry i will protect your life i will not allow anyone to harm you physically no one will kidnap you no one will take your life i will protect you this is the word of god that comes as a sharp two-edged sword, and it penetrates the being because this person is comforted. This person believes and trusts in God. And so this occurs, for the word of God is this. It is a two-edged sword. It does its work. It acts, and it does the work for good or for bad. Now, if the Lord is angry with a certain group of people, if the Lord is upset with people because they are sinning and sinning and they do not want to turn away from the evil that they're doing, but they do perverse things, the Lord will then open his mouth and say, I will punish them and I will cast them away from my presence. I will not listen to their prayers. They will be cast out. This word of God is a two edged sword that penetrates and it fulfills the will of God. The will of God is done. 
And this is why his word is then compared to a two-edged sword, which it breaks bones, it breaks everything, it penetrates and does the work, it carries out the miracle, it gives a blessing, or also the, the punishment comes upon those who are disobedient. Now, in the time of antiquity, the word of God was spoken through the mouth of Moses. And he said, if the people did not keep the commandments, that the time would come in which the Lord would be sending pestilence, sickness, and the people would be becoming insane. They would be having disturbances spiritually. The enemy would come against the people And all would be tormented. Now, the word of God, that two-edged sword, it penetrated so much that all of that has come to pass throughout time, throughout all the different eras in mankind. Because mankind, humanity, has forgotten God. They have turned away from him. So those words, those curses of punishment that God had spoken of with his mouth... With his two-edged sword, which is his word that has come from his mouth, all of that has come to pass. And this is why today we are suffering the consequences worldwide of many things, sicknesses and situations and of great needs. People are suffering because of the sin of those people that were stubborn. And we, in one way or another, We have inherited this generation after generation. This is why today what we need to do then is to convert to God so that he may cut those curses and that we no longer continue to inherit those things from our or our future generations. Do not inherit all of those curses, all of those situations and tribulations that the enemy or that the Lord spoke because of those people and their disobedience. So This is the word of God. It is a two-edged sword that penetrates. Now here in Revelation chapter 2, 2 verse 12, the Lord continues to speak to the churches, for he did tell him to speak to the seven churches in Asia, here in Pergamos, in the message to Pergamos, in verse 12. He says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These Things say, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. And who was the one who had the sharp two-edged sword? Sword? Well, our Lord Jesus Christ. For this is how John saw him in the vision. It says, these things says, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. It is that place where Satan's throne is because the people, they there are doing so much sin that the throne of Satan is there. And you are there in the middle of all of these people, these evil people and sinners. And it says, and you, you hold fast to my name and did did not deny my faith. So this is the Lord saying, I'm going to reward you because you are there in the midst of fire. But this is the word of God. This word, this sharp two-edged sword is speaking, saying to this preacher, this pastor of Pergamos, telling him not to worry that although he was in the midst of danger, God was with him and would bless him, deliver him, and would be rewarding him. Blessed is the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. The word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Verse 11. Now the vision. Now John here. In all of Revelation, it shares all of the visions revelations and all the things God showed him that would be happening. Some things he would explain, others were left as a mystery. But some of these things John did understand. Now here in verse 11, it says that he saw, 
it, now it says, now John is saying, I saw heaven opened. Now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Now this person, faithful and true, is Jesus Christ. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Now, this was all speaking concerning Jesus Christ. He saw this person riding on that white horse. Now, in 12 or 13, it says he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Of course, well, that the clothing dipped or the robe that was dipped in blood is what he experienced on the cross of Calvary. And it says in his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, just as I said before. Out of the mouth of the Lord comes curses for punishment or blessings. And all of this comes to pass because as is, it is a sharp sword, a two-edged sword. If the Lord gave it to speak a curse and punishment, well, then it will come to pass. Now, if the Lord, from what comes out of his two-edged sword, that's going to penetrate the heart, the joints, the bones for a blessing, well, that will come to pass. So this is saying that sharp sword, his mouth, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it, he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is Jesus Christ, his word. It is a sharp sword, a two edged sword that is used for Good to bless, to give triumph and victory, or it is used as a curse and punishment and for destruction, for pain and weeping to those that are disobedient, those who are arrogant, stubborn and rebellious. This, that is it, that two-edged sword, that word of the Lord. Now we go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, there we will be speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ and Hebrews 3, 6. Which says, now the apostle Paul is saying that Jesus Christ our Lord Jesus Christ being greater to Moses, that if God gave Moses a faithful word, now he was a great prophet. He was the number one prophet. Like him, there were no others. On earth, there was no other prophet like him because he was symbolizing that divine prophet, our Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, that prophet was still inferior to Jesus Christ. And if so, when Moses, as he worked as a prophet, he was there with his ministry to present himself to the people. He needed to put on a veil because the shine that he had, no one could be able to see him. They could not resist the great shine and splendor of his face. If God did that with Moses, now he being Inferior to Jesus Christ, imagine Jesus Christ as a prophet, as the savior, as that king, as that high priest who we have. He carries out all of those functions. Imagine the face of the Lord. Imagine that. Could we be worthy of seeing the face of the Lord? I think not. And so the Lord also probably would need to wear many veils so that we are able to look upon him and resist his presence. Now here. He being greater, verse 1, let's read from verse 1 to 19 very quickly. Now, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, 
So partakers, you are all partakers of the heavenly calling. And what is that heavenly calling? Well, the preaching of the gospel, the conversion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the heavenly calling. Now consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So consider this. Can let us consider it. This high priest, this great apostle, Jesus Christ, who was faithful, it says, who was faithful to him, Father, our God, who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Verse three, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Meaning, our Lord Jesus Christ had greater honor. It was superior to Moses. And Moses, he was faithful in all of his house. Meaning, he was faithful in all of the orders and commandments that God had given him. He executed it all. And he taught the people that was the house of God. All of the commandments, all of the orders, precepts. Statutes, testimonies, all of that is what made up the house of God. For he was there in that holiest of all place speaking to the Lord. And so Moses was faithful to that house, to the Lord's house. Now with greater reason, our Lord Jesus Christ being greater than Moses, having more glory And from his mouth, that sharp two-edged sword comes from, with greater reason, of course, he is higher above that house, which is the church also made up of men and women with hearts that have been converted to God. Men and women who do and keep all of the commandments, all of the orders of our Lord. Now, verse 4, for every house is built by someone. Right, so a house Any given construction is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses, verse 5, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of the things, of those things which would be spoken afterwards. So he was faithful in the house of God. Aside from teaching the commandments, the regulations, the precepts, he put them to practice. And he also judged the people and Uh, condemned some and blessed others. God used him to carry out miracles and signs. God used his time, his era, so that it would be a shadow of the things to come in the future, that it would be a shadow of all of the things that were going to come later on with our Lord Jesus Christ and his true house, the church, the tabernacle of God, made up of men and women who have converted to God. And so it says, Verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. It says whose house we are, men and women who have converted to God and are keeping the commandments of God. It says whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, now hear The mouth of God is speaking. That two-edged sword, verse 8, do not harden your hearts. This is the word of God speaking. The Lord, in his mouth, he has a two-edged sword. This is how John saw him. And that two-edged sword he used to speak. It says, do not harden your hearts. So he is giving an order. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, meaning back in the wilderness when their fathers, it says here in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me. Now, how did they test and try the Lord? Well, they demanded Moses and they said that they needed to eat meat, that they needed water, that they needed food, that it was better to return back to Egypt because there they had great amounts of food and that they in the wilderness were dying of hunger. That is this why Moses had brought them out to the wilderness to die of hunger? They did not observe or actually care about the miracles and signs that the Lord had already performed. So 
This is why the Lord spoke his sword, speaking his mouth, speaking these words and saying for 40 years, they saw the works of our God and they were ungrateful and they began to reproach Moses. Now it says because of this in verse 10, because of all of that, therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. There the word of God as a two edged sword speaking, saying that that generation, the people of Israel who had left Egypt through the hand of Moses and they were there dwelling in the wilderness, they would not enter the rest of the Lord. They would not rejoice in God's blessings and the presence of God because they were stubborn and rebellious and unbelieving. So the word of the Lord is like a sharp two edged sword. This came to pass. And so it all occurred because they were cast away from the presence of God. Verse 12, beware brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now here, this is saying that among the brothers and sisters, the believers in Jesus Christ, now we are speaking not of those in that time, but of the people today. We're going to include ourselves as well in this. It says, the apostle is saying, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now this, this is what we have seen in many people. I have seen in many people that while being in church and being in church for a certain amount of time, certain amount of years, they have turned back. They have turned back to sin. They have turned back to idolatry. They have turned back to carry out evil things. They have thrown away the word of God. They have thrown away and despised the word of God, which is a sharp two-edged sword. When God made them promises and God said that he was going to bless them, but no, they did not believe, but they turned back to continue sinning, to continue in the same things that they lived in the past as in the beginning. And so there are also others, some who are still congregating, but they are sinning. They are living in sin. For example, there are some who are still practicing witchcraft and sorcery, and they have been in the church for years, five, six, 15 years in church and still practicing witchcraft and sorcery. Because of course, they say, well, this is the fountain of their sustenance because they're not able to work in any other field. They don't want to do any other thing because they could. But what happens? Well, they have not truly wanted to repent. They have not wanted to repent. What are they waiting for? What are these people waiting for? What are they waiting for? These people who are sinning? Well, they are within the church. They come. They participate. They come and receive prophecy. They receive laying on of hands. They come pretending and they continue to live in adultery. They continue to live in fornication. They continue to con and deceive people and loaning money in, in very, with very high interest rates. And so this is a person who is using others, deceiving people with business, lying to people, speaking lies. And they're in church. And that word of God, that two-edged sword that came to penetrate, well, it will penetrate. Know this, but it will be a punishment. And the punishment will be harsh. And woe to those who practice witchcraft and sorcery. Be careful. Beware. Turn away. Repent. Many people, they tell me. They have written to me, people who are in our church, and they say to me, well, what do you think about this, sister? Here in my home, I have my family with me, and we go to church. When the congregation was open, we would go, and we would seek the Lord. And now here, everyone wants to celebrate Halloween now. 
They want to dress up as a devil, as a witch. And the children, they want to dress them up as well. They want to put costumes on them and make them celebrate this and that. And I teach them that this does not please God, but they don't obey me. They don't listen. Well, know this. The two-edged sword, that two-edged sword will penetrate. It will penetrate to punish. And when you are weeping those tears of blood, then you will say, Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Help me, Lord. Have mercy of me, Lord. And the Lord will not have mercy. Because the two-edged sword, when the Lord strikes it, there is nothing left to do. The punishment has arrived or the blessing has arrived because the Lord surely, he has driven that two-edged sword into me and has changed me, transformed me for the better, for good. Because the Lord allowed me to fall in love with God and for me to believe in him. And I love him and I follow the Lord. And so that two-edged sword has executed its beneficial effect in my life because he's transformed me. And this is what we want, that two-edged sword to come to our heart, to come to our soul, but for good, not for punishment. Be careful. Beware. Beware to those who are continuing to sin. And it's those who are here in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in, in departing from the living God. But rather, it says here, but exhort one another daily. So you must all admonish one another, correct one another. You should not permit and tolerate evil and sin. People also who share with me that their parents, their their parents are at home. They all live together as a family. And the father of the home is practicing witchcraft and sorcery and is cursing others. And he demands them as children that they need to watch for him. And so the person writes to me who goes to our church and says, what do I do? My father is evil doing all of this witchcraft and sorcery. He is perverse in this. And I'd like to leave. But also there's this teaching that we must honor mother and father. And so you have not understood the teaching then. I'm going to kind of get out of the topic a bit, stray from the topic. You have not understood the the teaching. Remember, Jesus Christ said you must honor mother and father. But remember... Our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, all of those who do not forsake mother and father for my cause is not worthy of me. For all of those who do not leave their husband, wife, children, mother, father, for my sake is not worthy of me. What does that mean? It means that husband did not allow the wife to seek God or that wife did not allow the husband to seek God. So they became enemies. There is when you need to make a decision. If you do not want to follow God and you prohibit me, well, then maybe we need to distance ourselves. Children, if the children oppose their parents in seeking God, well, then distance yourself. If the parents oppose their children from seeking the Lord, well, then distance yourself. The commandment there of honoring father and mother does not enter in in that moment. The commandment when the Lord said, he who leaves father, son, daughters, because of my, for my sake, for my name's sake, he is worthy of me. But if not, then he is not worthy. And so, as you can see, there are these paths and we must need to, we need to learn and understand why things are the way they are. And now this sister who says, well, her father is practicing witchcraft and sorcery and is doing very perverse things. And she says, well, no, I, I stay because I need to honor mother and father and also the father blasphemes against god and he speaks against the lord i said well he is an enemy of god and if he is an enemy of god he is your enemy as well so just distance yourself and go live somewhere else forget about that forget about that do not pay attention to that scripture of honoring father and mother in that case because he's an enemy of god if He was not an enemy. Then you need to keep that commandment of honoring father and mother. But as he has become an enemy of God, you no longer need to be there with him. Because then that other half that the Lord taught saying, he who leaves father and mother for my sake, that is when that comes to pass. Because we must defend God's word. We must defend it. And the same goes where now we continue in verse 13. But exhort one another daily. Yes, we must teach one another, correcting one another 
even in our families, some go to church, maybe all go to church, but there are some that do God's will more than others. And so this is when exhorting one another comes into play, meaning you tell people, you go to church, but why are you using those obscene words? Why are you lying? Why do you have such laziness? You don't want to work. You don't want to fulfill your responsibilities, your obligations. That's not correct. You go to church. What is your testimony? And this is how you teach people. You teach them with wisdom and you make them see that they are doing wrong because lest not that two-edged sword come and then there is nothing left to be done. After the blessing of God is lost and punishment from God comes, well, then there is nothing to be done. We cannot go back. And so there is no reversing this. Now in verse 14, well, we'll finish 13 to but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, this is the prophetic word in Psalm 95. Now here it says today, if you men and women, if you will hear His voice, that word of God, which is a two-edged sword. It says, do not harden your hearts. Do not be rebellious as in the rebellion, as it happened with the people of antiquity, as it happened in the day of rebellion, which was the people of antiquity in the wilderness. Who, for who having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, With whom was he angry 40 years? Who was God angry with for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Who did he swear with his sharp two-edged sword that they would not enter his rest? It says, but to those who did not obey, they were those who he swore would not enter his rest. Now we see that they could not enter because of their disobedience their unbelief it says that they could not enter because of unbelief now in four therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest let us fear lest any of you now the apostle was saying those you who still hold the the word of god the commandments of god those who have not failed him he tells them Therefore, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of that promise, meaning all of us who are trusting and we're walking toward eternal life. Lest some of you fall short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they heard, but they had no faith. And so it came in one ear and out the other, the word of God. For we who have believed do enter that rest. So those who have believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who have believed and heard that sword, we've heard the mouth that spoke, and it is a two-edged sword and has been penetrating our heart, our soul. Those who have believed, we do enter that rest. As the Lord said in his prophecy through David in a psalm, he said, so so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And that was concerning those who were disobedient. Because those who have believed, they will retain that word, that promise. And we will enter the rest of the Lord. We are in the Lord's rest, but we cannot lose it, but rather continue until the day of our death. It says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, the works of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything was finished before the foundation of the world. Verse four, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. 
And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Now that was God's word to the disobedient, to the unbelieving. And in the time of antiquity, to those who had received that promise, they lost the blessing. Now today in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he is making this calling to abide in his rest, to not going back and turning away. But if we are in the church and we say we believe in the Lord, that we are Christians, well, then we need to turn away from all sin and not living in sin because the Lord with the two-edged sword of his mouth, he will punish harshly those who are hypocrites, those who are pretending and serving as a stumbling stone in the lives of other people, of other believers. Now in verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, meaning that rest, that some still need to convert, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, now here today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, this was saying that if in the time, if in that time the Lord removed the rest and punished those who were disobedient, now through David, once again, he makes a promise, that marvelous promise for the future, for those who would convert to the gospel of the Lord. For them, this is their prophecy. It is for us. This prophecy that is in Psalm 95 from verse 7 to 8 today If you will hear his voice today, meaning in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is what today means. The gospel of Jesus today does not mean the law of Moses, because yesterday was the law of Moses, and all lost that divine grace. They lost the rest. They lost God's blessing. They lost the fellowship with God. They lost it all. So the Lord says through David, if today, today, After Christ, in the gospel today, do not harden your hearts so that the same does not occur to you that what happened with those of the time of antiquity, the people in the time of antiquity that perished, let not the same happen to you. So this is why I was here reminding you of what people share with me in their emails, how they share about those people giving a bad example, bad testimony, sinning, and they're still in church, and they don't like to be admonished for it. And so the Lord, he himself is the one who will make this admonishment. He will be punishing with his sharp two-edged sword, and he will also be blessing those who are steadfast, those who are humble, modest, who follow God's path and turn away from all evil, turn away from sin. So, Again, in ver- now here in verse 8, for if Joshua, for if Joshua had given them rest, remember Joshua succeeded Moses. After Moses died, then Joshua needed to continue to lead the people of Israel toward Canaan. So it says, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So this is emphasizing that when in Psalms, when he spoke through David saying today, if you will hear his voice, this is in reference to the preaching of the gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is who this is referring to. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Verse 9, so the people of God are no longer those of the time of antiquity called the people of Israel, but now it is the church of God, the congregation of the Lord. They are the people of God today. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Let us believe in Jesus Christ. Let us believe in his gospel. Let us believe in the word that comes forth from God. As I said to you in the beginning, the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit with his spiritual gifts is in the congregation and he is speaking to us, comforting us, making promises. But he wants us to be obedient, that there should be no evil heart in any or any unbelief that causes you to live in that same sin or causes you to turn back. 
And we, with the Holy Spirit and his spiritual gifts, which is what we have today, that living word of God, that efficient word, and the church is sustained by the spiritual gifts, and the church is sustained and grows because of the gift of prophecy. And so God speaking and God doing his work and transforming hearts. But as well, there is a group of rebellious and stubborn that exists. Well, for them, there's also the two-edged sword that comes also to do its work. Now in the verse, verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Meaning, let us be humble and meek, and let us follow the example and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now, this is a verse you ought to memorize and keep it in your mind and always repeat it so that you do not forget it. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, meaning God, to whom we must give account. Blessed is the name of the Lord, glorified is the name of our God, Let us all read verse 12 and let us memorize it. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If we, if we make this sword physical, making it something material and it penetrates everything. It penetrates the marrow. It penetrates and breaks bones and joints. What happens when it pierces in? What, what happens after that? Something happens. If it's something physical or material, well, the person dies immediately. So this word, this word of God that is living and powerful And does that wonderful work in the hearts of beings to transform and change. But also the Lord. For those that are stubborn. This is why the Lord gave us free will. So that we may make our own decisions. And we make our decision in saying, well, I'm going to follow this path or I'll follow this one. God here has presented many things to me. He has convinced me. He has convinced me with his mouth, with his word, when he has spoken to me. God has spoken to me. He spoke through dreams. He spoke to me through visions. He spoke to me through prophecy. And he has convinced me. He has pierced his sword in me and has converted me to him. He's transformed me. And here I am before the presence of God. And so, others, with others, he has done the same. But there are some, they have followed the wrong path. Others like pleasures, the pleasures of their flesh instead. And so, they follow after pleasures. And this is why they do everything that I mentioned to you before. So, the living word of God, the word of God is sharp. And it is powerful like a two-edged sword and it pierces in for punishment so that you die, so that you are destroyed. And so, reflect, analyze, make a decision. Which path do you want to follow? But now it's a time to change. It's a time for you to change. You cannot continue as you are continuing to live a disordered, a disorderly life because that two-edged sword is coming soon upon those who have been hypocrites with God because you are causing your family, neighbors, friends to be scandalized. You're giving a bad testimony. You are cause, causing others to suffer. You are harming people greatly. 
you damage your spiritual life and you're damaging the life of others. And when that two-edged sword comes, there's nothing left to be done and you will weep bitterly, but it will be too late. And so change, reflect. Let us respect and let us value the word of God. And this very beautiful verse that says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. As I said to you in the time of, and in the past, other religions, they would say, it's just this. It's just this book, this verse that is written here, that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's just this written word, but no, brothers and sisters, it is in part. If the Son of God reads it in spirit, well, then, yes, it does in a certain way, becomes that two-edged sword, but no. Everyone that does read it, reads it literally, then it just becomes to be a regular book to all those who read it literally without the spirit of God. Why? Because like others, many have not believed in the spirit of God and the spiritual gifts. They have not believed God speaks because they think God created the universe, but is he not capable of speaking then? According to the unbelievers, God does not speak. That was only in the time of antiquity when he spoke. God has now become mute. God is the same yesterday today and always. He is the same. He does not change. He speaks. He speaks to people. And so to the unbelieving, well, for the unbelieving, how can they have a two-edged sword when they read and read the Bible, but there's never a change in their life? They don't know the doctrine or understand it because the Spirit of God is not there teaching them because you need God, God, the living God, to truly be with us, teaching us, enlightening us, teaching us the doctrine, the Holy Spirit there, the spiritual gifts there. And when the Lord speaks to a person through prophecy or through a prophet, and he speaks to them, he touches the deepest parts of them, and that person cries. They cry. Just like there are many testimonies. I'm reminded of a woman who once came, and she was not a part of the congregation. She came for the first time. She came and asked for prophecy, and so we prayed for her, and the Holy Spirit says to her, the word of God, the living word of God, said to her, you have in your womb a terminal illness because you did not want to have that child. The child that you did not want to have has left behind a terminal illness in your womb, and you will die from that illness and she immediately burst into tears bitter tears in that moment she bursted into tears and the holy spirit then said to her you have repented and as you have repented i will show you a path i will cause that sickness to slumber It will slumber and you will see your children grow and you will see them grow up into great professionals. That sickness will be slumbered until a certain time. It will be dormant, dormant for a certain time. And well, she shared that she had uterine cancer in her womb, in her uterus, and she had severe pain all of the time. She had to be on medication because of the severe pain. And in the moment that God spoke to her, the word of God as that sharp two-edged sword that pierced her conscience, she began to weep bitterly, repenting because she had had an abortion. She admitted she had an abortion on purpose. Now, God punished her because she ended up having uterine cancer, and she didn't know it. And so she bitterly cried, and God gave her a chance. Starting from that day, no longer did she have any pain, and that sickness was dormant for about 20 years or such. Later on, after those 20 years, that's when once again, that sickness awoke, and three months later, she died. But the word of God came to pass because it is a two-edged sword that pierces. That is the living word of God. And I invite you all that when the church is reopened and we're praying to God that he allows us to at least to open maybe three days a week, we're taking a look at this as an option. We're praying to God. And so you go to church and you go to the congregation, praise God, glorify God, love him, and hear that 
two-edged sword, the mouth of the Lord, but it's a blessing. It will be a blessing so that this two-edged sword transforms you and takes away all sinning tendencies and takes away all evil desires, all of those things that you do that are unlawful. God will take that away because that is what that two-edged sword does. Glorified and praised is the name of our Lord. We're going to be praising the Lord, exalting his name. O holy, almighty Father, blessed Lord, thank you, holy Father, because your word, your word is that two-edged sword. It pierces the soul and heart, the conscience. It pierces all of our being. And you, Lord, when you speak, Everything that you say is fulfilled, be it to receive blessings or punishment. That is how your word is, Father. It never comes back void. Your word is not void, but first it does what it is that you please it to do, because that is your word. It is like that sharp two-edged sword. Thank you, my heavenly Father. Thank you, because we have understood We have comprehended your ways and we are marveled and we are joyful in walking in this path. We are happy. We are happy to have this privilege that you have found us. You have found us and called us and we are here standing before you, Lord, receiving instructions from your behalf. And desiring for you to teach us, correct us, guide us always down the righteous path. And that we always walk down this path of perfection. That we may submit ourselves to your commandments, to your holy will. And respect and value your word and your commands. Holy Father, help us to live in holiness For we want to enjoy, starting now, your presence to enjoy this heaven, that eternity full of happiness with your presence. Holy Father, we thank you for all of these marvels. My Father, now I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, who has in his mouth that two-edged sword, In his name, Lord, I pray that you extend your hand, your miraculous healing, powerful hand upon all people, men and women, children, and any other age, any age, whoever is sick of any type of illness, that are sick also with psychological illnesses, which is a product of witchcraft and sorcery. May you deliver, Lord, those that are tormented by evil spirits. Holy Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray that you extend your hand and you deliver, you cleanse, break chains, break ties. Take away and remove the curses of the devil. Remove all of the work of the enemy and deliver each one and bless Bless them, work miracles and signs, and also, Lord, have mercy of those who have not yet repented and have been able to live an upright life before you. Lord, have mercy of them. Help them to change. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Cleanse and deliver and bless all. And, Lord, also, they have petitions. They have desires in their heart. Fulfill the longings and desires of their heart, Lord. And support them, sustain them with the best things, give them also uh, material blessings and spiritual blendings, great abundance that they never lack anything that they need. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The honor, glory, all praise before our God. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Now let us sing to our God. My heart is blissful day and night. Chorus 22. Chorus 22. My heart is blissful day and night. Let us sing to our God. Mi corazón contento está, mi corazón contento está, porque el Señor ya me salvó. 
Mi corazón contento está, mi corazón contento está, porque el Señor ya me salvó. Oh, qué feliz, oh, qué feliz se siente el alma con Jesús, por la paz que ningún otro puede dar. Oh, qué feliz, oh, qué feliz se siente el alma con Jesús, por la paz que ningún otro puede dar. Una mirada de fe, una mirada de fe, es la que puede salvar al pecador. Una mirada de fe, una mirada de fe, es la que puede salvar al pecador. Y si tú vienes a Cristo Jesús, Él te perdonará. Porque una mirada de fe es la que te puede salvar. Y si tú vienes a Cristo Jesús, Él te perdonará. Porque una mirada de fe es la que te puede salvar. Glory to the Lord, and that is how it will be. And we thank the Lord for all of His mercy, His infinite goodness thank you and continue forward be strong and courageous be steadfast do not be discouraged and make your hearts joyful for the lord is near you and he will take away sadness depression all of these things may god be with you greatly and i send you many hugs and many kisses thank you and god bless you until next